This episode of Storyworthy is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. You can register a domain name now for only $2.95. Yeah, that's right. GoDaddy is offering one new or transfer.com for the very low price of $2.95. Yeah, whether you're starting a new business, you just want to put your idea online, or you just want people to look at you because you need attention, you can make a new.com or you can transfer a .com for only $2.95. And when you're over there at GoDaddy, enter the code STORY295 in the promo code at checkout, and then you are in fact supporting this podcast. You'll get what you want. We'll get what we want. Hey, it's Johnny Hoops. You're listening to Storyworthy. Go Pats. Welcome to the Storyworthy Podcast. Here are your hosts, Christine Blackburn and Hannes Finney. Welcome to Storyworthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm here with Hannes Finney, and we're coming to you from the Hollywood Walk of Fame. We've set our our, our mobile unit. Um, we're at one of the lesser known stars, um, Bob Smith. Bob who, Smith. Now, listen. I don't think that's not a name on the Walk of Fame. Is that's it? not a name on the Walk of Fame. But half the names on the Walk of Fame, you don't know who they are. You would that's never know who they are because, in fact, I don't know if people know this out there, but you can buy a star on the Walk of Fame. Right. You need a certain amount of signatures, which you can pay people to sign. You and also have to pay. There's a sign of fifteen hundred dollars, twenty five hundred dollars, no, some kind of. It's like seven thousand dollars. Oh, is it? You can okay. buy a star on the Walk of Fame. It, you have to fall into one of five categories. Yeah. So it's either television, film, you wrote a book record producing or you know something involving records right. and then something involving announcing and when you look at the stars on the walk of fame they're going to have that little emblem either the tv emblem which by the way has an antenna right a tv that uh, that no <laughs> child in, uh, can identify because it's kind of roundish and it has tv antenna no you know? child nobody under 30 right can right recognize that's what that. i refer to and I, the, those are children to me then the film camera the, that little emblem has these two big huge reels right right which so is now could no, be an iphone right and the and I believe that the recording one is one of those uh, old uh, 1920s, uh, like the horn. It is. It's a horn with a record player. That's yeah. exactly right. Good one, Hannes. Yeah. So here we are on the Walk of Fame. It's There's over 3,000 stars now on the Walk of Fame. There are. And are you channeling your old... Uh Pitch As from, you know, uh, I used to Tourist. give tours of the Hollywood uh, of Hollywood, and so I this this uh, information comes directly. to Oddly me. enough, the only thing I think that the only people that are not uh, in show business are the uh, Apollo astronauts who went to the moon. They have a star. They have a right star. at Hollywood and Highland. Well, so do a lot of musicians, though, as well. Yeah. Right. No, 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 I mean, but they're in entertainment. Oh, I see. The only in, people in who aren't in entertainment. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, where we are standing on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard and Gower, I happen to be here quite frequently because, of course, as you see, there's Pep Boys right on the corner. Yes. That's the thing that people don't understand about Hollywood is like there's only about a two blocks where you're like, it's Hollywood Boulevard, it's the Walk of Fame. And then you go a couple more blocks and you're on Hollywood Boulevard and it's just the Subway Sandwich Shop. Right, or, regular. You know, or a barber shop. Or, or another wig shop. A lot of wig mm. shops on Hollywood Boulevard. I think they're fronts is what I think. Yeah. They're fronts for other businesses because how many wigs do you need? I Who know. Who needs a wig at all? I know. How many wigs? I know. I know. how many. That used to be downtown Burbank was nothing but wig shops. Now they've... What? They've, drag queens. Drag queens need wigs. How That's many drag true. queens Sean Merrick, poss- why did you just... That came out of Sean just, Merrick's na- mouth Sean so Merrick never naturally. says anything. It's suddenly like drag queens. <laughs> Drag queens. Because I don't want to fuck a man with short hair. That makes me think he's a man. When I engage in my transsexual uh, exploits, I want the illusion. <laughs> and you got to anchor the wig because I want to grab it and pull on it. Oh, that's, that's so Oh, oh I, that's where I went too far. I see uh, that recently, stepped over actually, the line. Carol, Carol and Brunetto, our friend Hannah, yes. she showed me this sex toy. Where it's yeah. basically like a bandage that you hold, a man would hold in either one of his hands, right? Yeah. It's like a bandage but it has handles on either side and you're supposed to put it behind the girl's head as you pull her toward your car. <laughs> well, I, I'm toy. sorry. Is this... I don't see any fun in that toy. Okay, well, this is so many questions. Number <laughs> one, do you have T-Rex arms that you can't just hold her head in your hands? What is? No, why do you need like a band? A, because it's like a band. Like your cock is so long that you need an eight-foot yoga band. This woman's 
<laughs> and she showed it to you on the internet or she owns it? She she showed it to me on the internet. We were going over funny things we've seen online, and that's what she pulled up. I, I pulled up a funnier dive video. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, you were she's like, doing. right, she's out there. Yeah. I <laughs> That one is a that's a tough one. Now you've seen the wedge. What's the that's wedge? That's a useful. Well, it's a thing you can buy for your bedroom where you it's sort of a triangular wedge thing so that you can get into various positions. You need this as you get older. That's what I'm oh, saying. Oh, I see. You're not as flexible as you used to be. Now you would think that this show tonight is about sex toys, but it's not. I want it to be. You know, Johnny, I need you to change your story. I want to hear about sex toys. <laughs> Actually, tonight's story is called I Almost Made a Movie with Jack Black. It and was a porno movie. It was can- going to be a homosexual porn film with Jack Black. I say to Johnny Hoops, I say, Johnny, you got to bring forth a story that everybody can relate to. And he says, well, that's easy. I almost did a movie with Jack Black. I know. We've all who, been there. Who hasn't that happened to? <laughs> yeah, we've all been there with that. Well, t- Jack Black, I will he say. Actually, by the way, Jack Black endorses the cock pull. <laughs> Uh, strap. It does have, it's got tenacious D written on the side of it. <laughs> He's going and, for Kyle Gass. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Actually, I'll tell you something. Jack Black, you know his his real name, Hannes? Thomas Jacob Black. That's his real name, Thomas Jacob. But well, then, then his name, it's not that far from his name. His first name is Thomas. Yeah, but his middle name is Jacob, and you can make Jacob into Jack. Oh, you are reaching. What's your middle name, Hannes? Michael. We should have gone with that. Michael, and that's so easy. I know. Why the fuck is my name Michael Hannes Finney? I mean, Michael Finney. I mean, Mike Finney. Everybody would buy me a Guinness every time they saw me, and I'd be a lot of fun. But they named me Hannes, so I grew up to be funny. Because I'm just going to start calling no you one, Mike. That would be Mickey. <laughs> Mickey. See, but Michael can be Mickey. Jake can be Jack I or see. Jake. Well, I'll tell you something. This Thomas Jacob Jack Black has made quite a career for himself. Uh, he is from here in uh, Santa Monica. He lived, he grew up right down the street. And now, as you know, he's a producer, a comedian, a voiceover artist, a writer, a musician. A cockstrap and an endorser. Actor. He's won two Golden Globes. And he is part of the comedic rock group Tenacious D. And so he's done all these things. And now our guest tonight, Johnny Hoops. Johnny Hoops brings forth this topic. I almost made a movie with Jack Black. And I know where this is going. Yes, yes, exactly. And by the way, you need to know that even if the name Johnny Hoops doesn't ring a bell, you've seen you Johnny Hoops. You know this man. He's been in so many commercials over the past 20 years. You've seen him. He did like eight commercials in the last three months, Hannes. I know. He's and we're old. not remotely jealous of him, oh my are gosh. we, Christine? Well, he posts on Facebook things like, look at the check I got today. <laughs> it's like, shut the fuck up, Johnny. Yeah, I know. And I got to like this. I got to like this. I don't want to like this you at all. Working actor I need prick. a jealousy button is what I need. Uh, but he's very I know tall he's, and he's very thin. And then you'll be like, oh, when you see his picture, you'll be like, oh, I've seen that guy. Well, and also, he did something. He was in the cult favorite Salami Fight Club. Salami Fight Club. Folks, Look that up you on YouTube. If you don't know Salami Fight Club, stop everything you're doing. You go you to stop, your Google. Yeah, turn this. Pause this. You, you Google Salami Fight Club. Oddly enough, that is what uh, Carolyn was putting in uh, when she came across the uh, cock strap. Uh, exactly. But Johnny Hoops, I think here's where he's going to lead, Hannes. He's going to lead down that evil path of Hollywood where you almost get a roll, you get very, very, very close, and then. Well, we don't know. We don't want to spoil it. No, but I know. What, but you can say it, and I can say it. It doesn't happen. Yeah. That's the thing, you know, my old friend Dave Woolley. It's in the title. I to... almost made a movie with Jack Black. He already gave it away. All right. We, yeah. Okay. Well, you can turn it off now. You don't need to hear the story. No, I'm kidding. You want to hear the story. But it's like my old friend Dave Woolley used to say never buy the suit until you cash the check. Like, that you is can such make, a we're good talking about like piece of commercials, right? You can, be, you can get booked in a commercial, you can go and shoot a commercial, and you get $550 for the day of shooting. Day rate. Your day rate. Now, if you get edited in such a way that you are not recognizable in this commercial or only your elbow happens to be in it, which happens all the time, that's it. You made $550 for that commercial. But see, I would I would call that a job because you made $550. That's right. But you're thinking I'm in a Budweiser ad and this is going to run for And I'm going to make year. like 10 like I, in my experience and I've done quite a few commercials. My experience is a good commercial is if you make over say $5,000 in the run of the commercial. If yeah. you're lucky, you're going to make ten or fifteen, but you can't live off one commercial a year for sure. Right. Now, like you just said, don't buy the suit till you cash the check. I always say I don't even believe I'm working until I'm in the makeup chair. Oh, for I instance, see. L- about two weeks ago, I have an audition. I go to the audition. I get the call back. 
I go to the callback. Now I wait like an hour and a half. The first time I waited like half hour. Now I have to wait a super long time because it's a callback and they're mixing and matching people. And then I go home. The agent calls. Christine, you're on a veil. And that means you have essentially booked the job, but somebody else might be on a veil too. And they just want y'all to hold that space open, hold that date because you're on a veil. You're very, very, very close. And then what happens, Honest? If you don't get the job, nothing happens. That's what I mean. In other words, you they don't, don't call, call you, you to tell you you didn't get the job. You're right. You just they just said to me, Christine, be available from May eighth to the twelfth, and then or it was April eighth to the twelfth, and then April eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth go by, and I say to myself, Well, I guess I'm not working on that job. Right, but you but you still because of course we're desperate and people looking for approval. We think to ourselves. It could be that they delayed the shoot. Now, it, and it, but I'm it is possible. Stupid. Yeah, uh, I, I'm totally that stupid. Really, but it, it's, it's like no, I've been called jobs about. Jobs don't come back. You think jobs come back? No, it's like, but things get delayed to the next week, and they don't tell you that. And then all of a sudden, like I got a call once from like they didn't they didn't get to call me to tell me I had the job before the wardrobe guy called me and said, uh, "Okay, so what are your sizes?" And I'm like, "Okay, wait." Who are you? Oh, I'm wardrobe on, uh, you know, Schlitz. Schlitz, like they're doing ads. But, you know, <laughs> he called me from 1948. He said, listen, mister, we've got a radio ad for you. What are your sizes? And, uh, yeah, so it's like I find out because the guy called me and told me that two days from now I'll go into wardrobe that I got the job. They haven't even officially told me. The communication's all fucked up. This is the main thing. Right, because the actor or the actress is the last person to get plugged in before the job shoots. All the pre-production is done, the writing is done, the the spending of the money is done, and the last thing they do is they plug in an actor. And they have no interest whatsoever in giving you any information. No, because you're if, just a prop. You're and just if you one get called, piece. yeah, if you get called and you say, you know what, something terrible happened, uh, my car blew up, I can't come for another hour, they'll go, don't bother, and they'll go to the next person, say, which okay, is thanks, why bye. they have people on a veil. You'd be say, lucky yeah. if they say thanks. They don't even say thanks, right. Uh, now, I had a couple, actually it was last spring, there was a pilot that I was, you know, again, I had the audition, I had to call back, and now... They tell me, Francine Selkirk over in Studio City, she tells me they want you, Christine, but we got to find you the husband, right? So yeah. now I go in two or maybe three times again to her office. And you're not getting paid for any no, of this. of course you're not getting paid. Now, they're screen testing husbands for me. So here's Christine going through the same thing, and they're in front of all the people are sitting there. This was actually a sitcom. The pe- you know, there's writers in the room. There's producers and directors, and everybody's in the room. Makeup ready. Everything's ready. And then one day, I just never heard anything else. So, did the project go away? Did they find a new wife? Did What happened? Did they make it two guys? Now it's a gay couple? We don't know. We don't know. So, could I call the casting director and say, hey, what happened? Yeah. No, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. Well, I had a thing where I had an audition for a pilot several years ago, and and I was like, I went and I went to our acting teacher, Brian Reese, and I did a private session, and I got ready for this audition, and 90 minutes before I was supposed to go there... They called me and said they've canceled the whole thing. Wow. Don't don't go. Don't go. It's like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, not the day before. It's like 90 minutes. I could have been in the car already accounting for traffic. Right. You could get to the audition and the door is locked. Yeah, exactly. Right. So there, I think what we're saying, folks, is if you're thinking about being an actor right. or an actress and you're right. moving and to Los Angeles. If you're Angeles, thinking about moving to Los Angeles, stay, stay the home. fuck out. <laughs> we got enough actors. We got enough cars. You can't just stay home. a dead cat in this town without hitting a car right. or, or an actor. And if you think that like you're the you're the, the most handsome guy in your town, <laughs> stay the fuck home. <laughs> because every handsome guy and every hot chick from every town in America has already come here. They're here. Well, They're you used to here. say that to me all the time, Hannes, is that when... And you do get overwhelmed in L.A. and you think, oh, my God, I'm this tiny fish in this huge pool. You do have to remember that it is the entertainment capital of the world. And yes. the most beautiful people, literally, literally, the yeah. most beautiful people in the entire world are coming here. And so yeah. that's the fish you're swimming with. Yeah, exactly. So don't count on that. I'm depressed. Because I've seen – no, and it's like – I don't know what to – like I've seen – I did a little thing on the, on the aviator until I was like – for like two hours I was two feet from Kate Blanchett. Oh, wow. She's so beautiful in person, you can't breathe. I bet, I bet. You can't breathe. She's so good looking. It's like these people aren't good looking like, oh, you know, I remember the, the 
prom queen and king from my high school. They were the good looking people. No, these yeah. people are in a different well, DNA one time, category. One of my older sisters was trying to was telling me how her daughter, my niece, wanted to be, you know, a model or get pictures taken or whatever. And and she asked me this was when I was living in Pittsburgh and she asked me if I would take her down to my agency that I had in Pittsburgh and I did although I knew this was going to be tough now what your my, agent by the way also ran a bowling alley yeah that's the way it works in Pittsburgh <laughs> my niece though what she had going for her she's like five foot eleven she's a tall girl right but I remember my agent Stephen Black who was very short with people and he still is and whatever that's just who he is I remember he's talking to my niece she's about 14 and he opens the magazine and he says you want to be a model you want to be a model you see these people in here that's what you're competing with you look like that no you don't Boom. Yep. See ya. I mean, just fucking harsh in your right. face. But that's but uh, but uh, that's but right. That's for because, modeling. That no, modeling no, but that, no, but that's good because it's like if people ever ask me if they should be a comedian, I say no. And I, my my principle is if you can be talked out of it, then you shouldn't do it. Mm. If you can be talked out of comedy, if you can be talked out of modeling, if you can be talked out of it, then it's not for you because you're going to face endless rejection. And if you don't have a truly irrational belief in yourself you'll never survive because comedy especially you listen to a tape of yourself like the first year you did comedy and you're like what the fuck was i thinking you, there's one laugh in here and mm -hmm. it's one guy mm -hmm. but your memory is i killed you didn't kill you sucked ass you have to live in a delusional bubble for a long time. Well, you always tell me, Hannes, that you're never as good as you think you are, but you're also not as bad that as you think you are. That is absolutely true as well. That yes, helps you are me. never that as bad. That gives me a little soulless. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, they talk about, you know, first world problems. It's like, I almost got an acting job. And there's people who can't get a call back. Mm -hmm. People can't even get an audition. Right. You know, and so they're listening to that story and they're like, What's your problem? Well, the pro you know, there's always something else. There's well, my recommendation to anybody who's thinking stay about stay out of the city. No, it's not that. I love Los Angeles. No, even if I wasn't no, we, acting we're at all. saying you don't come. Yeah, that's, you, that's what I'm, a, yeah. No, but I, I would say, you know, what you got to do is create your own content because if you think you're going to sit around and wait to get cast, yeah, that's you're the new sitting thing. Sitting around a long time. That right? What the new the new world is? Make it yourself, and then. What we want to do is be you want to make your own content, which has heart, soul, and integrity, and then you want to sell out. If you for a build lot it, of money. they will come. You want to sell it to, to Funny or Die or a network and have them completely destroy it, but you got the money. And this is a good time to mention that the story where the podcast is available for sale. It is six we digit are figure. <laughs> and I'll talk of the you. highest order. No, no, no. <laughs> you will you wanna you could buy this in a come buy this. I'm hey, folks, begging you to come buy it. If us. you would like to support our show, we sure would appreciate it. And here's a couple ways you can do it. Number one, follow us on Twitter. That's easy. That doesn't cost you anything. Also, you could uh, always email us if you have any questions or comments. You can email at info at storyworthypodcast.com. And we're on Facebook, of course. Of course, you can head on over to storyworthypodcast.com and click on our Amazon ad when in fact you shop. Because yeah. that gives us a little taste. Then you can buy, yeah, you can buy, uh, uh, like, How to Start My Acting Career book, <laughs> uh, which is just a, a page of uh, blank uh, pages, but they're they're crinkly because they're covered in tears. Hannes, remember our former guest, Mark Miller? He's been on the show a couple of times. Yes. He did a story called The Hollywood Circle of Life, talking about going around to the garage sales and yard sales in L.A. And, and all the books on all how to start your career, how to be a filmmaker. Books. And now they're all on the roadside for 25 cents. Right. Everybody's reading the same goddamn book. The right. practical handbook for the actor, you know, or on acting, the Meisner right. book. Right, and that's the crazy thing is it's like it's such a weird crapshooty kind of a thing it's like you can write a book about how to fix a motor right. in a car. Right. You can't really write a book on how to get your career going when there's everybody's got a different story. Well, and also, there, it's not like there is anybody out here paying for you. I mean, you're hiring you. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't work that way. I mean, you're, you're talking about trying to make a career with a project that doesn't even exist yet. Except, unless you're Johnny Hoops. Unless you're Johnny Hoops, you guys. And you're in and, demand. Unless you, unless you start in Salami Fight Club. I hear that he fucks a lot of people in order to get somewhere in show business, but that's just something I hear. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are, stay tuned because Johnny Hoops is on the way here. Next time on Storyworthy, we have writer-comedian Ron Zimmerman. And I'll be discussing how I am now a shrink. That's next time on Storyworthy. Hi, 
Hey, it's Naomi Grossman, Pepper from American Horror Story Asylum, and you're listening to Storyworthy. And we're back. We've actually gone into the Hollywood and Highland Mall. Uh, Christine wanted to buy some makeup at the Mac store. That is the only worthy thing going on in Hollywood and Highland is that goddamn makeup store. I'm telling you. Yes, yes. It's not the greatest mall. It's a little strange. It is uh, attached, though, to the uh, Grauman's Chinese Theater, which is pretty cool. Right. And it's also home to the Dolby Theater, which is where they hold the Academy Awards. And I saw Neil Young last month. So Oh, that's right. That's Boy, right. Boy, that was a good show. You know, it only holds 3,400 people. So the Dolby Seems Theater, like 3,400 is nothing. The Hollywood Bowl is 15,000. You yeah, I mean? but that's like outside. A yeah, theater I know, but that holds 3,400 people, that seems 3, like a lot. No, that's a very small theater. And to see Neil Young, boy, that was a treat. See, I've been in like these, you know, I'll appear occasionally in some theatrical thing in North Hollywood in a, th- a theater that holds 69 and there's 12 people in the audience. That's a sad thing. That's not that bad. 12, I, I would do, I would no, do I know, but it's like, people. but it's again, it's like when it comes to like politics, they always get the smallest venue possible so they have to stuff people in. Right. I like you that never idea. Want, that's the idea. Like remember Mitt Romney a couple of years ago, it's like, like an idiot. He had a rally inside the Detroit Superdome or whatever their new stadium Which is. Which you can't like, fill that. There were like 400 people on the 50-yard line and this giant empty stadium. Yeah, you it's can't like, fill that. Do you guys not know anything about the so business So the next of time politics? we do story hour, uh, the story where the we're hour of truth. We're actually going to be in a closet. We're going to be in the closet at my house. Everybody come on over. Right, and, where uh, you have this. One person comes and we've packed it out. <laughs> comes. Ladies and gentlemen, Johnny Hoops is here right now. He is an actor here in Los Angeles, and he's been doing it for 20 years. He's appeared in over 30 national commercials, and he had a reoccurring role on My Name is Earl. He was also in the movie Gentleman Broncos. You remember that, Hannes? Gentleman Broncos, yes. I, it's I believe with uh, Jared Hess. Jared Hess directed it. Steve, I mean, Steve, Sam Rockwell. Yeah, I Sam Rockwell. The it's the same guy who did uh, Napoleon Dynamite. Yeah, I mean, a lot of Jared weird. Hess. Yeah, a lot of yeah, a lot of strange stuff going on in there. Uh, and, and every commercial you've ever seen. ever seen. Johnny Hoops is in it all. And like we were talking about before, you got to check out Salami Fight Club, which he co-stars with Bjorn Johnson in that great film. You can find Johnny. I saw Bjorn uh, Johnson or yeah. Johnson in uh, production of uh, uh, Educating Rita. Oh, is at the that Colony right? Theater in Burbank. It was excellent. Well, you know that he started with the Salami Fight Club. That's right. Uh, you can find Johnny on Facebook, of course, and also he's got a Twitter page at jhoops76. So, folks, wherever you are, please put your hands together for Johnny Hoops. Early part of 2000, I booked a few national commercials with a director named Jared Hess. Then one day I got a call from Jared in 2005. He wanted me to go to Paramount Studios to go to a casting office. The only thing they wanted from me is a snapshot at that time. So when I was there, I gave them my agent's number. So my agent got a phone call to see if I was available to go to Paramount Studios to meet some people from Nickelodeon. So I went to Paramount, and at that time I met with the head people of Nickelodeon and got a script from them. And they told me that it was shooting in Mexico. So basically I had to put in my paperwork to get a passport because it's shooting in Mexico. You got to understand, I didn't audition for this role at all. So when I was there, they asked me what my schedule was in the next few days. They wanted me to go meet up with the wardrobe people. So of course I said, no problem. So I went there and tried on different outfits and they took a lot of different pictures of me. So that went pretty well. Then a couple weeks later, I had more meetings with executives of Paramount. That was three separate meetings. All the meetings went very well. Then I had another meeting with the casting director. This meeting was a little weird. She asked me different questions about what I have done as an actor. So I have told her what I have done in the past. And then she started asking me about my home life. Like, was my parents still married, et cetera? And I was thinking to myself, what the hell does this have to do with this movie? The meeting lasted about 30 minutes. So between all of that, I was going over the script in my lines. So the next thing I had to do was to meet with the stunt coordinator to go over the things I'm going to do in the movie. I went to the beach many times to train for this role. I know by reading the script and talking to the stunt coordinator that there was a lot of physical moves in this movie. So all these things I've done so far is about a month or so. So the messed up part of, of the story so far is that I'm not getting paid for my time. But I'm thinking to myself, Who cares? Because I'm going to be in a motion picture with Jack Black shooting in Mexico. What couldn't be more cooler than that? 
So I'm still training at the beach in the gym, and I'm doing some pratfalls at the beach off the lifeguard towers into the sand, killing myself. <laughs> I wanted to be 100% for whatever they threw at me in this movie. So I was training and having my lines down and ready to rock. Then I had some meetings with Jared to go over things, and he wanted to know how everything was going with me at Paramount. Then Jared told me I was going to do a lot of stunts with Jack at the screen test. Did I have a problem with that? And I said, no. I said to him, I already started training for it. You got to think, I'm about 120 pounds, and Jack is pushing like 230. So basically, that's why I'm training before anything. So then a couple of weeks later, my agent got a phone call to set up a time to have a screen test with Jack. The time and place was all set up. They wanted me to go to Universal Studios I met up with Jack and Jared at Jack's production company in a bungalow on Universal Lot. When I got there, we hung out a little bit, shoot the shit for a while. So we finally went inside to put a few scenes on film. I was prepared for whatever they threw at me. So Jared picked this one scene out. It was a dialogue only scene. So Jack asked me if I knew the scene. I said, I was familiar with the scene in the dialogue. And Jack said that if I didn't mind if we went over the lines because he didn't read the scene. Between you and I, he wasn't fucking prepared. So we finally did the scene a few different ways, and I thought it went pretty well. He liked what I did, and Jared did too. So Jared wanted to put a different scene on film. The second scene was a stunt scene to show off my body type and did a few wrestling moves with Jack. So now they have two different things to show the executives and other people. So after we did the screen test, I got a call from Jared on my cell phone about a week to a week and a half later telling me that I didn't get the part. So I asked him why, and he said it basically came down to that Jack and I didn't look right on screen together. The executives thought we looked like two white boys on screen together. So instead, they got a Hispanic with my body type to play my part. Because Jack was playing Hispanic in their movie, it made sense to add another Hispanic in the mix. So basically, I got used for two months so they could find someone else with my body type. It's funny now looking back at it, but let me tell you, my agent and I were pretty fucking pissed. Okay, now you have to tell us the name of the movie is... Nacho Libre. And that became quite a hit for Jared Hess and Jack Black. Yeah, because that was his first film after Napoleon Napoleon Dynamite. Dynamite. Right. Yeah. And so this must have been absolutely crushing. Yeah, I didn't realize because I knew you had done yeah, it was work toward it, but that you weren't getting paid any of that time. No, not at all. Because often you will be paid, you know, even on commercial, it's like, oh, you're coming in for wardrobe, it's going to be two hours, you get two hours, you know, you get... Yeah, for wardrobe get, on a commercial, you know hoops, you get paid like 60 bucks for the wardrobe fitting. Yeah, you get you, you, you get your time, you're paid for your time to go wherever yeah, you have exactly. to go to do whatever you have to do. But no, for two months, no. Nothing, so you didn't zero. get any wardrobe fees, you didn't get a screen test fee, you got I nothing. I didn't get wardrobe fees, I didn't get a screen test fee, I didn't get mileage, I didn't get nothing. Did you zero. just want to say, I'll be Mexican for you? <laughs> yeah, basically. Paint I could my say skin. That or I can just go tan a lot, you know what I mean? Whatever. Right, I mean, they. It, I mean, the logic of, well, we've got a very white guy playing a Mexican, having two white guys play Mexicans might not seem right. You would think that would occur to them immediately, as well, opposed to... Well, you would think they would... You know, or the it. first week, not two months in, where they're like, oh, you know what? Maybe we should have, I don't know. But it's like, yeah, it, it's weird. But then Gerald has to... Jared. Put Jared. You, Jared, I'm sorry. Uh, Gerald Hess is a guy who owes me money. Okay. No, Jared has did put you in uh, Gentleman Broncos. He did yes, direct he did. that. Yes, he did. Did well, he wait, say? Let's hear that. Yeah. Did he say it was sort of a makeup, or did um, he just never really. speak to you again about Nacho Libre? No, not really. It was just like he was. He says I'm doing another movie and I want you in it, and for Gentleman Broncos. Yeah. So he he didn't say he was sorry for the other one. You know what happened? There's this. Basically, he threw it on the executives and everybody at Nickelodeon. Yeah. And, you know, he didn't want to take responsibility of, of right. And he happened, wouldn't have you know at that mean? point. He would not necessarily have had the power to overrule rule those people. No, it's his first big studio movie. I was going to say, yeah, it was his first movie, so he didn't really have much leverage. I remember those in that time. I remember you would just go have lunch with Jared Hess. Yeah, I used to hang out at his. Um, I used to hang out with. Um, Napoleon Dynamite, yeah, John Heater, right. I used to hang out with everybody at his apartment, play video games. I mean, 
And just hanging out. Just right. hanging out. And the reason Jared has found me was because of Salami Fight Club. I went into an audition um, in Santa Monica. And when I went in, he's like, oh, I love you. I love you. And he hugged me and stuff. And I'm like, who the hell is this guy? I never <laughs> met him in my life. You know what I mean? He goes, I love Salami Fight Club. Salami Fight Club is an incredible is, piece. Thank you. Would you yeah. like to tell us a little bit about that? Um, we shot it back in late 90s, I wow. would say. Like 99, 98, something like that. Oh my yeah. gosh, I had no idea it was so old because it totally holds up. Yeah, yeah it's that. Salami is forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know a lot of people that won't eat bacon because of this movie now. Oh, that's well, true. Well, tell it why. What were you wearing? Okay, um, so basically I'm almost nude. I know some people don't want to see that, but that's all right. Um, I Those have, people don't work here. <laughs> <laughs> so I have on um, tan pan. I'm tan um, like underwear on, and I have a skirt made out of bacon. So raw it's basically, bacon. it's yeah. raw bacon, a tape, brown tape, duct right. tape, duct tape, and with. Raw bacon stapled on to the tape. <laughs> and that is where the movie starts. That's where the movie starts. And you wear, that's your whole wardrobe for the whole movie. That's my whole, yeah, exactly. And same with Bjorn Johnson. Bjorn Johnson's the same And, and you, he's teaching you how to fight he's with salamis, me, like they're nunchucks. Nunchucks, he's teaching me the club, and he's teaching me different fight moves and stuff like that. And so you had had some experience with Pratt Falls and stuff, or... I mean, Salami Fight Club, it looked like some of the some of the physical stuff you did in that movie, it didn't look like you had prepared. It looked like he was beating you up. No, he was kicking my ass, yes. <laughs> um, no, I had auditioned for that role. How many people auditioned for this role? And we had to wrestle with other guys for this role. Are you kidding? No. Did you have to take off your clothes? No, I think we just took off our shirts. Yeah. But, I mean, that was about it. They just wanted to see the... You know, a lot of skinny people. Well, I like yeah. this. Um, I like the idea of you going to the beach and working out and really taking it seriously. Because if Jared Hess calls you on the phone and says, I want you for this movie, sends you over to Paramount, your agent is involved. And you then you keep these meeting meetings, these people. That's the weird thing. Of course you believe them. Yeah. Because this is all happening. You are in the room with Jack Black, bullshitting, hanging out, going through scenes. Of yeah. course you believe them. Of course. Of course. You believe everything. So you, know, you go they to the beach, the you're working out, you're yeah. working on your Pratt Falls. My Pratt Falls. I know. think falling off a lifeguard station is quite a picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. It is funny. Denise taught me. Yeah. Oh, I see. Our agent. Our, our, a, a common person we know. A yeah. common person we know. <laughs> That's she how you fall, She's fallen off many things in Los Angeles. And Boston. So I suppose it's, you're lucky that Jared Hess called you in person and, and, and at least gave you some closure on what happened rather than let you just linger. It, the, it could have been, yeah, that you never got a the, call yeah. and you, the movie is released in theaters a year later and you're like, wait, what? What the hell happened? Yeah, basically. I mean, you know, I'm just glad he called me. He told me the story. He told me why, what happened. You know what I mean? Right. So it's not like... Like you said, I was lingered or, you know what I mean? Yeah. You didn't have to hang on. Hang on and think you know, that I, I do have this movie still, but then nothing happened. And when you saw the movie Nacho Libre, what was going through your head? I never watched it. Oh, I won't wow. watch it. Yeah, I can. I wouldn't I, really I, watch I, it. I wouldn't put two cents in watching it. Right on, Hoops. I no. love that. I, I, I really respect Stick that. To my guns. I saw the movie and it wasn't that good. Thank you. And I remember the kid who was playing opposite Jack Black, he was just so forgettable. And he was very young, too. He was just like, he was nothing. No. Yeah, and I think they used me. I don't know if they used me, but... They used you. Yeah, well, okay. Well, my body type to mm -hmm. find him, because if you look at him... Yeah, tall and he's thin. He's tall and thin and same, but he's yeah. Hispanic. And see, Jack's playing Hispanic in the movie. Yeah. So like I said, we look like two white boys on screen. So that's why they threw the Hispanic in as his tag team partner to make it look like he's Hispanic too. Yeah, but yeah. if they're already going to take the leap to make Jack Black look Mexican, well, then right, they can make Right, which was you quite a Hispanic. leap, by yeah. the way. I think that may have been a problem is like he's just so white. That <laughs> it's like, you you know, you give him, you, you color his hair black, you give him a mustache and you curl his hair. It's like, look, he's Mexican. It's That's like, um, yeah. he's not. No, no he's not. not. Well, he's not I think, though, in Nacho Libre, I think he wore like a cape, a lot of it, a cape and a hood. He did. He wore Well, when he's cape, fighting, yeah. Yeah, when he was pictures, fighting. So, Johnny, have you had any other experiences in L.A. like that or even ones that are not like that? I mean, that were similar in which you were led on and then it didn't happen. No, not really. No, I think that was about the only one. So now I when mean, you when you get on a veil for these commercials, you feel pretty confident. I do, but you still like you were saying before, 
you never know because there could be two to three people on a veil. Oh, you were saying about wardrobe? You got a call? Yeah, yeah. I got a call um, last year for a commercial. I was on a veil. I knew I was on a veil, okay? Then I get a call, phone call from the wardrobe people. She goes, oh, congratulations. I'm booking the job. I'm like, who the hell are you? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not my agent. It's not, you know. It's not it, the casting director. It's not the casting director. It's nobody. I mean, it's the wardrobe people. Right. And for all you know, they could be wrong. So then you're really, yeah, exactly. you got to call they your agent call and the say. Wrong person, right? I think yeah. wardrobe and makeup people know more than a no, lot of I, us. They usually, no, I, I, I <laughs> would generally believe it. But yet the cynic in me is like, well, what if they got the wrong information? Mm-hmm. Or what if it's like, oh, they, and then they tell somebody and then the director gets mad or paranoid and decides that he has to go with somebody else because now wardrobe said that they had, you know, it's always like until your agent says it, like you said, until you're in the makeup chair, until you're yeah, shooting. Exactly. Yeah, you're but once you get positive. screen tested and you're talking with a, I, I can just see that disappointment. All the executives oh, no, no, yeah. at Paramount. I yeah. mean... That's women. yeah. That's very yeah. Was it Sherry Lansing at the time? Yes, it was. Wow, she ran yeah, Paramount Sharon, Pictures. Yeah, it was Sharon Lansing. Wow, so you have a meeting with Sherry Lansing by and, myself. Yeah. Yeah, wow, just her and I, and just talked and did our thing. And then when I was in with the casting director, Jared was there, and Jared asked me. He goes, "Do you want to go in? Do you want me to go in with you?" Yeah. I'm like, no, I'll, I'm fine. I'll do Good it myself. Good for you. So I went and did it myself. Yeah. Have you well, ever used your passport? No, never have a stamp. I don't have a damn stamp on that damn passport. <laughs> we got to get you out of the country. Yeah, we got to get you at least to Vancouver or something. Hey, listen, yes, you grew up you. in Boston, is that right? Connecticut. In Connecticut. Where? What, what city in Connecticut? Hartford. I was born in Hartford. And I, the insurance capital of America. Yes, it is. Uh-huh. And then you came to L.A.? I came, um, I moved, uh, right out of high school, I came to L.A. How did you come to Los Angeles right out of high school? That's a, that's a bold move, man. Um, I don't, um, my father and I had like some different things going on and we didn't see eye to eye so shocking yeah right that someone in show business would have problems with their parent <laughs> so basically i just moved out and just thought to come out here i don't know why don't ask me i, I don't know why. but that's a big I move just, coast to coast it is and and it's it, it's a big move because you don't know anybody out here i didn't know a soul out here right. you know what i mean you don't i was homeless for a while Right. Did you stay on people's couch? No, you didn't, no, have, you didn't I, know anybody. So what did you do? Anybody. Where did you stay? I stood, this is funny. I stayed in front of the Hollywood High School. You stayed in front of in Hollywood High School? Behind a bush. On Orange Avenue? Yes. Were you sleeping outside? Yes, I was. Johnny. I didn't know anybody. And I didn't, you know, I had money, but I didn't have a lot of money. You and had a car? I had a c- car, yes. And then what? And then, oh, okay. Then um, I, um, I started doing extra work. I did one job in extra work. I hated it. I just hated it, how they treat people and stuff like right. that. Right, they treat you like jobs. animals, yeah. right? Cattle. Box lunches and stuff like that. And I'm like, you know what, screw this. So I met somebody on set, and they go, oh, you should have an agent. Don't you have an agent? You have a good character look and stuff like that. And I said, no, I don't have an agent. And then they put me in um, to my first agent, Denise. How long did you? were you homeless? For about... I don't know, like six months, maybe. Johnny, though, that's a. I had, you know, I've known you for a long time. I yeah. had no idea you literally slept outside Hollywood High School I under a bush. I don't tell a lot of people that. It's well, you're not telling anybody now. It's yeah, a no. very small. No, no, all ten, all like, ten of us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, really, this is yeah, tremendous. It's crazy, huh? And so, did you keep your stuff in your car? Kept my stuff in the car. And then at night, you would put I, a sleeping bag out. Put a sleeping bag in the sleep. It's crazy. And then I would go to Burger King up the street on High, High, Highland and yeah, yeah, wash yeah. up. Did they have an in-out burger then? Because that was that's there now. They, you know what? I don't remember. Yeah, that's too bad. I mean, because in-out burger wouldn't been a step up from Burger King. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why I went to Burger King. I think Burger King was up on Highland, past Hollywood. Bowl. Burger King is not going to object to someone anymore. washing up in the bathroom. They're like, eh, we're Burger King. Yeah. You know, what the They're hell? probably used to it. Right? So then you yeah, get an well, apartment. Especially down in then Hollywood, you get an apartment. Yeah. Then I got an apartment. And, and then, then we move forward. And then I just move forward. You start you start booking some jobs. Then I started booking some jobs. Did you have any odd jobs here in L.A. before you became an actor? Uh, no, nothing. So Zero. that's that's very exciting. I mean, that's encouraging that you came out to be an actor and that's you've stuck with that and you've only been an actor. That's it. Yeah, I know. It's, you know, it's... it's very it gets, fortunate. It's very, yes, thank you. But it's it's... It's disappointing at the beginning 
when you're an actor because you're going on so many auditions and you're not booking anything. You're if like, you're lucky, you're even going on auditions. Of course, yes. So I went on 80 auditions before I booked my first job. Ladies and gentlemen, did you hear that, America? America. 80 auditions and then booked an, and then booked a job. Yeah. 80 auditions. How many auditions did you have last year, Hannes? Not 80. Right. So maybe you get 10 auditions a year. Do that for eight years. Sleep under a bush in front of Hollywood Jesus. High School for eight fucking years. <laughs> and then get, yeah. Maybe that's key. Maybe we need some bush energy. We need to sleep. <laughs> I, and I mean that key. in the cleanest possible way. We need to sleep <laughs> under a bush. Yeah. No, that's fascinating. I think that's a, that's a story yeah. you might want to write out. I think that's a good story, too. You know, yeah, for, yeah first getting that. to L.A. Did your parents know that you were homeless? No, I never. My parents divorced when I was 16, and my mother took off and never came back to my father and left my father with me and my two brothers. And so then you haven't talked to your mother? And No, I haven't seen my mother for like 20 years, no. That's the last thing I knew, she was living in um, Oregon. How could, how could she abandon her son like that? I don't know how you can. I don't know. I don't know how anybody I'm so could do that. I'm so sorry. That's I, crushing. Yeah, I know. But, wow. you know, I Oddly talk- enough, though, who she is, Sherry Lansing <laughs> is your mother. That's in case cool. you didn't know that. Oops, tell <laughs> us the commercials that folks can see you in now. Because I want people to realize, here we are talking to a guy who came out to L.A. with nothing, literally was homeless, but now you are on television all the time. Uh, I am so proud of you. Tell, you. tell us the spots we can see you in right now. Um, I have an ADT st- spot running right now. Wait, what's ADT? Oh, security. Uh, security. Uh-huh. Um, I have a Honda commercial coming out. What's the one on you with the bat in the on the oh, basketball that's, court? Oh, oh, thank you. Um, that's um, USTA. It's um, United States Tennis Association. <laughs> Do I know that? My gosh, I, I get an email for them twice a week. Shh. I get an email from those folks. I get their magazine. Rafael Nadal is my boyfriend. Oh. Good for you. In my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> He's everyone's so boyfriend. So we can see you on television all the time. All the time. Yeah. And that's wonderful. And I'm so you've come so far, Johnny. Thank you. And on my Facebook page, I have all my work I ever did. Some so. amazing pictures. So go to pictures, Facebook. Yeah, slash. So Johnny Hoops or Johnny Hooper? It's Johnny Hoops page. It's under Johnny Hoops. Your real name so. is Johnny Hooper, right? John, John Hooper. Hooper. And what happened there? Um... There was like seven or eight other people in Screen Actors Guild that have Hooper. So um, Johnny Hoops up. is so great for you. It's a perfect name Some for you. Some people like it. Jared hates it. Jared has hates it. Yeah, well, fuck him. He didn't. No, put just, <laughs> fuck him. He didn't put me in his movie. No, right? listen. Yeah. I'm glad you were in Gentleman Broncos, and you were with Sam Rockwell in that, as I recall. Sam Rockwell, yes. In the middle of the desert. Where'd you shoot that? Uh, we shot it in Utah, um, out near the Salt Flats. I see. And there were so many gnats. I have like thousands of gnats. Bites. And you spent so much time with Sam. I mean, that must have been. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. He's a, he's very quiet. The first day I met him, it was funny. We got I got out of the van after they picked me up at the airport. Got at the hotel. Sam's outside. And he said to me, he goes, are you in the movie? And I said, yes. He goes, okay, here's my cell phone number. <laughs> he gives me his cell phone number. He doesn't know me from Adam and Eve. You know what I mean? That's and awesome. he just gives me his number. And, but I he's like very him. quiet. He's very quiet. He doesn't like to go hang out a lot. He's, you know, he's very focused when he's on the set. He's very, you know he's what I mean? He's a great actor. Yeah, he's a great actor. Right. He always wants to be in his room going over his lines and stuff. He never, we got him to come out once and have drinks with us. Sounds like the opposite of Jack Black. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 100%. Hmm. Yeah, he's just a nut. Hey, you want to play some Shotgun Storyworthy? Sure. Why not? Music can only mean one thing. It's time for Shotgun Storyworthy. The game where our storyteller spins the storyworthy wheel of truth and tells a true one-minute story about the topic it lands on. So everybody, say it with me. Spin that wheel! School days. I went to school in Groton, Connecticut um, for high school. I went to... Uh, like a tech school. So basically you go half in classes and half in shop. So when I was a freshman, I did, you, just, you go through every shop. In the, they have culinary arts, they have hairdressing, they have automotive, auto body, everything. So I went through all that. And um, at the end of, before the end of the school year, you have to pick what shop you want. So I picked culinary arts. 
So they had enough people already that I guess got better grades than I did for culinary arts. So I was number four on the list for culinary arts. So before that, so then they go, you have to pick another shop. So I picked metal trades, where you weld and stuff like that. So I did that for a while, and then I was told there's an opening in culinary arts. The first three people didn't want to go there, so they asked me if I wanted I said, hell yeah, I'm going. So I went to culinary arts, and I did culinary arts for four years. So there you yeah, go. No, but I, do, I, th- I love the idea of a trade school in high school in terms of real, actually learning a real skill. Yes, it's like, you know, you do, <clears throat> they used you do to four, um, four weeks, and it's, it's easier because you mix it up. You know what I mean? You go back and forth, go back and forth. To you mean class. between like, wood, uh, oh, you mean real school and then Yeah, like, school. you know, math, English, all that stuff. Are you a good then, cook? I'm a decent cook. What yeah. do you like to cook? I'm a better baker. Oh, I, don't know. I, like, I like baking, baking. too. I yeah. like baking, too. I don't How know. about squirrel? When you were living in the no. bush, did you cook up any no. squirrel? No, no, you... no. Hey, listen, thank you so much for coming on. You shared some oh, great for some me. great stories and yeah, great thanks, insight man. that I had no idea. And I'm so glad you're here and you're successful. Thank you. I you deserve it. it. Thank you. You do. Thank you. All right, thank you guys, you we're going to wrap it up right about now. I'd like to thank everybody here at Sideshow Network, including Sean Merrick and Sean Merrick. Roddy Swearingen. Roddy Swearingen. And of course, you know John Thomas Griffith, Hannes. He wrote the theme song, Follow Me. Yeah, I've heard that. I heard it in a bush once. I was, I was <laughs> and on behalf of Johnny Hoops himself, our storyteller tonight, and of course you, Hannes Finney, my Me. dear friend and co-host, my Woo. name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a story-worthy week. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Story Worthy.